Hello and welcome to Mark Chatterton's Rock Files YouTube channel. Today I would like to welcome onto the show Peter Banks, the founder and keyboard player from the band After the Fire. Many people will have heard of After the Fire from their US top 10 hit single, De Commissar, in 1983, but the band had been going since the early 70s and began as a progressive rock band before reinventing themselves as a new wave act in the late 70s. Their sound has always been defined by the keyboard playing of Peter, and I'm sure he'll be able to explain more about his playing and enlighten us today about the band. So welcome to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Mark. Good to be here. Right. Um, let's start off with when After Fire first started. You you were in um, East London, Essex area in Atminster. Um, before you started the band, you, you'd obviously been playing keyboards, piano for quite a long time. Were you, did you start that at a very early age? Uh, well, I actually started on guitar. Right. So, um, and uh, I got my first guitar as a, it was either a birthday or Christmas present when I was 13 and struggled through with, I think it was the book called Burt Whedon Play in a Day, yeah, yeah. which is a little bit of a misnomer. It took me a bit longer than that. Um, and one of the things a guitarist has to get used to is when you when you first start to play, particularly if it's not an expensive guitar, is, is your sore tips of your fingers mm. when you're mm. holding down the strings. But yeah, so I, I, uh, I was in, uh, first of all, it was in, uh, learning from people in school uh, that uh, played uh, extraordinarily well. I learned a lot from people that were good guitarists. Uh, and then uh, my cousin was playing, so we did a lot of things together. I, probably my first actual live performance was with him. Uh, and then uh, it kind of went on. I still play guitar and got into bands when we moved up. Uh, from the Isle of Wight, because that's where I'm from originally. We moved to the Upminster area, and the first band I was in was in Hornchurch then, and went off to uni, was in a band then, uh, and that some of the early material um, of After the Fire came from from that band um, when we took some of the the pieces across into the early After the Fire. Uh, and it was in that band, actually, the uni, the uni time, um, that I changed to keyboards. I just felt I could do more with keyboards. And we'd already had a keyboard player in the band, so I borrowed her keyboard. And actually, I had played kind of yeah. a churchy, organy type um, instruments for a while. So although I didn't have any formal training, I felt I could... Um, make the transfer easily. Sorry, that was a bit long winded, Mark. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Not to worry. Um, yeah, I was just going to quickly ask you about your musical influences, because um, you sort of presumably started the band playing in bands as sort of in the 60s, late 60s or whatever. Um, you know, who, who influenced you mostly, would you say? Um, well, I, I actually always prefer the word inspira uh, inspiration. Yes, yeah, sure. um, yeah. I think influences can be can be mis misconstrued in that I'm not so sure. I think it was more the days, the culture of the day that was influencing me. So, for instance, when I got my guitar when I was 13, it was because the guitar was the fashionable instrument. Um, probably previously to that, a good few years before it had been the saxophone or something like that. So it was the trendy instrument to have. And um, it so and I just I, I, so I definitely inf, inf, uh, influenced by popular culture of the time. The inspirations, um, I mean, back then, it was very much the music of the 60s. So um, the Beatles were an inspiration, a huge inspiration, um, alongside other bands like the, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, um, the Who, lots of those early 60s bands. Um, one of the things you did was to try and learn the songs. Um, uh, I mentioned the learning from guys in the school. 
and I, and I remember what was extraordinary was they had this little kind of a a, a man cave under it was like a basement in the school and they were able to play there and whenever he picked up a guitar and he would play a riff like one out of the searches or something like that and because he'd got the right key the right tone you it gave me this little shiver of mm. recognition huh. and i thought oh i wish i could i wish i could play that such that somebody gets that sense of of yeah that's that's really it's not just about matching the original it's about that feeling that people get when you hear something that that chimes with you so have i answered the question there <laughs> yeah you, you said a few groups anyway no i was just wondering... oh yeah no inspiration yeah it was yeah. about inspirations yeah no yeah, yeah to get back to the root yeah so um yeah so those were the early days and then later on it was uh, more the people like um John Lord from Deep Purple, Keith Emerson from The Nice, and then Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Um, I found them really inspirational, and that's what helped me to consider migrating over to keyboards from guitar. Yeah. And why did you decide to f uh, form After the Fire in the first place? It would be about 1971, I think. Uh, well, that yeah, that's an interesting question. I su I suppose I I was writing all this music, uh, and you needed a kind of if you were going to perform, you needed a vehicle. So mm. I just at the time, every environment I was in, I wanted to 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 either form a band or be in a band. So that was a driving force. It was no no more complex than that. So there wasn't a, uh, at the time, there wasn't a, a deeper, a deeper thought, although I think there was an element of um, where, where I felt as a, as a person of faith that I, I felt that it was a good thing to do um, rather than, than just stay within uh, an area that um, was, was separate. Um, so that that was something that was a, a driving force. Yes, because I understand we're all three members of the band Christians then at, at that time. Uh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 So obviously that that was a little bit of an influence. I take it as well in in sort of getting going. Yeah, although we were absolutely determined not not to be just a band that played in church youth groups uh, mm. and mm. and so on like that. Yeah. Um, it, it was a it, it the, the drive was to have commercial success yeah, um, yeah. we were not trying to hide it behind uh, a different um a different yeah. topic or or a, a, a mission if you like yeah um, sure it, yeah yeah it, it was straight out we mm. wanted to be successful so were you working at the same time or, or was it a full-time mm -hmm. thing the group uh, yeah, yeah, I was a school teacher at the time. Uh, let me let me go. Yeah, so I it was probably probably 72. Um, and I worked as a school teacher, the band lasted the very first edition of the band lasted for a year. And then it kind of fell apart. Um, uh, and um, I then got the opportunity to join a band professionally, which I did for a little while. So I did leave teaching, yeah. Um, but that that band didn't work out. Although, in the course of that, I met John Russell, and yeah. he was in the band that I was working. I, with. I was about to show you this actually. Um, there we oh, go. Right, yes, that's the one. No, Narnia. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm on the back there with a look, looking a little more pursuit. Yeah, <laughs> than I am yeah. now. I won't show that, but yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, there were some good tracks on that. I mean, I remember the track Agape. That was that was probably the highlight of the album. I don't know. If you agree there uh yeah well, i think that's got some of my keyboard parts yeah and, it was uh, very ha hammond organ orientated certainly yeah, yeah yeah and i i mean i i did feel a little bit aggrieved that i wasn't given a writing credit because a lot of that was my composition but yeah there, there were, as it was effectively a backing band for this singer pauline philby yeah um, yeah and she was the writer there were very there were very strict rules that 
that, that I wasn't that happy happy about and that was one of the contributing reasons why I left mm. um, having said that though there was there were some really good experiences um, with that band uh, we opened for some great um, uh, great bands such as Thin Lizzy back in yeah. the days when Phil Lynott was um, healthy and well mm. um, one of the loudest bands I've ever heard um, in a small venue and uh, and we recorded that album in um some serious recording studios and i'd not really had i'd had limited recording experience uh before i had done some work for um television uh, and i think it was southern television back then so we'd gone down to the studios there and recorded but this was kind of recording an album so that was that was the start of a, a a lengthy learning curve, which I'm still on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So after that, you re restarted after the fire, and this time, Andy Piercy came along, and also Robin Charles, I understand, um, and that was about 1974. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Andy was the first, um, and what happened with that? That was that was a really interesting time he we knew one another pretty well yeah um, and he'd come over he might have even come over to stay at my mum and dad's and um we were i was i still had a provisional driving license then and he'd got a full driving license so sometimes he used to sit in with me to to help me um to be able to drive around as I was learning to drive effectively. And um, we had this incredibly long chat uh, and he was asking me all these questions and I thought he was being really provocative and um, negative about the kind of thoughts that mm. a, a musical direction and vision that I'd had for after the fire to go forward from where we were at. Uh, and um, so I, I, I got to the, the to the point of saying goodbye to him and I said, um, Andy, I'm really sorry you feel the way you do because I said, you and I would just be so brilliant in a band together. <laughs> and un, uh, unbeknown to me, that was completely the opposite of what he was thinking. Mm. Uh, and, and also, unbeknown to me, he went home, which was um, Upminster to Enfield, wrote a letter, drove all the way back over, posted it through the letterbox <laughs> and then drove home mm. saying, explaining why he was asking me the questions because he really wanted to check out and, and that he really wanted to work with me. Mm. Uh, and we became this great songwriting or, or music writing partnership. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because obviously, um, I presume from the mid 70s, you, you were touring constantly and ever so busy but you did you have a manager in those days or, or was it just just the four of you or whatever and no we did have a manager yeah 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 and we also had an agent who who um booked the booked the dates um it was less about touring than doing loads of one-off one-off dates yeah I mean, it was effectively touring but mm. we would we weren't able to um stay apart from with if there were people that we knew we had this network of wonderful people that would put the whole band up mm. um and so we would be sleeping in our sleeping bags on the floor in the van it was pretty basic yeah <laughs> and um you obviously you were you were trying to get a recording deal i presume in those days and nothing happened and then it got to 1977 with the rise of punk and you decided to do your own album yourself. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we pretty much were not. Sign, signs of change here. Oh, that, that's, the, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it was quite revolutionary, I suppose, in those days, because obviously some punk bands were doing their own singles, but to do a whole album was quite quite an achievement and obviously you needed to get a lot of finance behind you and and so on but you you still had four thousand copies 
printed up initially, I understand. Um, yeah, and I think it was 2000, which we sold much quicker than we imagined. And we mm. uh, we had two more runs of a thousand, which is, yeah. I think, the, the minimum quantity that we could get. Um, and yeah, that yeah, they sold out really quickly. Uh, and um, was it Richard Skinner? What was the program? Was it Newsbeat? Because, yeah. as you said, it was mm. an album and not a single. We got invited on up to the BBC to be this. Uh, Andy was brilliant in that. It was just Andy and myself. Andy was brilliant in the interview. And I was absolutely hopeless. I just froze when I was mm. asked the mm. question. Uh, so um, that was another little bit of learning curves. Um, and uh, yes, so uh, and we also heard that if um, if it had gone through the record shops and so on, it would have made the charts quite. It would have done very well yeah, um, yeah. with the number that we'd sold on advance orders and and then the, effectively the release date we would have um we'd have clocked in a, a good position on the mm. album charts yeah but um obviously it, it didn't you didn't get the um record company interest and that's why you you bought it out yourself but then eventually you did get a rec recording uh, deal with um cbs records and yeah. that was that later in 78 i think yeah that yeah. yeah so we recorded the album in 77 uh it took us a lot longer than we thought um we did deals with the studio we one of, one of our crew managed to come up with a, mm. a loan um we didn't pay for the studio time for yonks um until we got the money in from the sales and then um yes you're right what what happened was in 78 once we'd recorded the album in fact 77 to 78 we started to write this new set of material and it and it we had moved on from yeah. what you labeled the progressive rock which of course was not a term back then no no that's no. that's a kind of retrospective um uh, phrase that yeah. describes mm. these mm. this lengthy symphonic style loads of pieces um uh, shoehorned in in into one piece uh and so we wrote we just had this fantastic liberty and we were writing these songs like no tomorrow we we were knocking songs out very easily uh and um then the the situation changed radically we had proved to a certain extent that we had a fan base and that we were marketable with the, the success of signs of change and we had this new um much more vibrant and accessible material uh, and yes it, it happened in a way it happened very fast so by the end of that year we were we were signed and we'd already started um recording for CBS because I, I was going to ask you about this um, change of material and and it's almost like you reinvented yourselves uh, where, where did the idea come from was it spurred on by the punk scene and new wave and so on you know did someone in the band say we've got to change if we're going to make it we've got to change the way we we play the music and so on where, where did that come from um, I think again it was a it was a, a, a current cultural influence mm. uh, and so um i think actually the first thing to change was we started to wear tight jeans and have our hair cut yeah, uh, yeah and but the music the the transfer of the music yes we we had done a support act uh, opening show for the damned mm. right at the height of the the kind of uh, punk explosion and I mean, they only lasted 20 minutes. We, we, we had actually lasted the whole of our set, which was longer than their, their headline yeah. set. So, and, and, and we were, we were, we had a kind of pass into all the bands that were playing at the marquee at the time, mm. because we were now known enough to get free entry as a kind of um, Z list sleb. Um, so we were going in and watching a lot of the bands that were happening at the time. Mm. Um, but the change of music was not, that was natural and not a 
deliberate or contrived right decision. so it's a, it's a gradual thing really yeah um i wouldn't say it was gradual i think it no. was quite quick yeah but it, it just happened that mm. that was what we that we were there was a lot of interest in the band yeah. from record companies mm. and we kind of got this burden of the science of change material which we'd been playing and and we felt a little bit stagnant in that mm. um in the music that we were writing and actually pro possibly if you broke down all the pieces that comprised the size of change songs and made them into separate mm. power pop yeah. semi pop songs we might have had another five or six albums out of the out yeah. of some of those just mm. single pieces yeah. so that's what happened we just we just wrote songs mm. a three minute 10 second songs mm. and now because of the people that we were talking to we were meeting record company scouts we were having conversations uh and and people were saying things uh, right you, you you your material is not going to get played on the radio you need to you need to have pieces that are three four minutes mm. long and we thought yeah you know they're right mm. <laughs> uh, we're not going to be this isn't going to happen if we do it um keep doing these long pieces but it was a very natural very instinctive um change so um a metamorphosis rather than a, than a, than Re a, a reinvention a very yeah, yeah than a reinvention yeah. Yeah, yeah i mean was there a time where you stopped playing the hammond organ and then moved to more more sort of electronic keyboards or or did you keep keep the hammond organ with you for you know that time uh well sign um one rule for you and joy are both on the hammond organ right okay yeah uh, and the mini moog now i bought the mini moog in uh the later the sort of around about 75. yeah so yeah. the last few years of the signs of change material that um that era of after the fire were playing um was very much hammond and synth yeah and 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 the, and the minimo features heavily on the signs of change album when we recorded one rule for you we did one rule for you and joy at the same time mm. we had that same uh setup so it was the hammond and the mini moog in the session uh rupert hine um the late great uh rupert rented in a yamaha cs80 which is the synth that i've still got and um i feature on on my little um youtube channel it kind of revolutionized my thinking because here was this unbelievably playable instrument tactile mm. um in terms of the what you played and the sounds and the the, the, the feel of the instrument and i absolutely loved it and i just thought you know this is we've got to move on we've we've mm. got to change the hammond and and get this and i I did eventually, uh, and we totally didn't regret it. It was it's a wonderful, wonderful instrument, and it became part of the characteristic sound yeah, of yeah. ATF from the uh, after the fire because I keep shortening it to <laughs> ATF, which is uh, an acronym um, from Laser Love uh, onwards, uh, and yet. The album, the Laser Love album, does feature some of the. There's, there's a good few tracks that have got the original Hammond still on yeah, it with yeah. the DS80 mm. overdubbed uh, as a, as an extra track. Yeah. So let let's move on to um, Laser Love, which which came out in '79, um, I think. Yeah. And um, yes. was that the one where you had? trouble with the producers and you you went through about five producers before you finally settled on them um, muff winwood okay um i'm not so sure we had trouble with producers um it might have been our 
our naivety about the whole recording process mm. in that we were probably too green to mm. to understand the, the the recording process because we hadn't none of us had done that much of it i i was relatively experienced because i i had done keyboard sessions on oh, a lot of albums maybe i'd recorded over in the 70s about 18 albums or something for a, for a local producer um but but as a band we i think what we were expecting that we would sound the same on record as we do live rather than the the record being it's it's a totally different medium mm, mm. you live you've got the kind of the ambience of the the room the audience the, the everything that the venue there's so much else going on the, the the feedback you're getting from um the audience and and how you you lift your game when certain things happen and set structure all that that mm. uh, ad additional work that goes into making a good live performance. And I think we were naively expecting, as I mentioned, that it would be the same, that we'd be able to recreate the live sound on the record. And we didn't with the producers we had. They were proper producers. Mm. So they were taking us yeah. at, at, and putting something into the music that was extra and, and would be the, the lovely little bits you, you'd hear on a record and you think, oh, I've got to play that again. Mm. But we weren't, we hadn't learned that. Um, and so we did go through a couple of producers. You're absolutely right. But at the end of the day, it was only, I think we worked with Rupert. We, we started to work with Rupert on Laser Love and something didn't work out. And I actually think, I don't think it was us. I think it was CBS that drew a halt to that. Mm. And we worked with Rhett Davis um, in... Uh, um, Mickey Most Studio, what was that one called? I can't remember offhand. Anyway, Rack, rack was it? Rack recordings, yeah, well yeah. done. Yeah, and I think only Check It Out survived from that those sessions. Mm. Um, and then we worked with Muff, and what Muff, Muff was smart. Muff had a really good engineer mate, and he employed him. And so there was this combination of an excellent engineer, Muff with his kind of long term knowledge of the music industry and what was commercial, what would work, and us as um, uh, the, the new boys, the new kids on the block that were trying to learn this art. So whilst Laser Love, in some ways, the album Laser Love is quite rough and ready, I think that there's a lot of charm about it. I think it does capture what we were about in that change yeah, and, yeah. and, and that, that period. Yeah. Um, it is not a sophisticated album. So when you um, record it, were you wanting to get a, a hit album or a hit single or both? You know, because I know you should have been on top of the pops with Laser Love, uh, sorry, with One Rule For You, and then Gary Newman got got chosen instead of you because they were both two similar types of music, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and um, yeah, we wanted a hit single, and, and One Rule For You was a hit single, it just wasn't a big hit yeah, single. Yeah, it didn't, didn't quite, yeah, it got to the top 40, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's right, and actually what happened was it was it was absolutely rocketing up the charts, and um there was this sense of right we don't need to keep we don't need to keep pushing the um uh the radio and and so on uh because it, it's got its own momentum and, and whereas actually that is the very point if they just kept going with the the work that they were doing mm, yeah to get radio play i think it would have would have carried on yeah um top of the pops would have would have nailed it yeah it's absolutely yeah. right um yeah, it was like it. It was just one of those things, um, and they, those things happen. And and uh, it it launched Gary Newman's career. It didn't launch ours, but but um, what a cracking song 
he had. Yeah, yeah it, it sure. Deserved, yeah. It deserved the exposure that it, mm. that it got. Because mm. I suppose you could have been labelled with all the electronic type music as well because of the, the synthesizer aspect of, of your music, do you think? Or if, if you got yeah. a bit more... Uh, yeah, I, I do think we tried to move away. We we didn't see ourselves as an electronic no, man. No. We mm. we kind of saw ourselves as a bit of a hybrid between we yeah. had an yeah, electronic yeah. influence, but mm. it was still a a rock band. Because you were. you appeared on uh, the Algro Whistle Test, didn't you? I, I don't know if that was be before seventy nine or about that time. It was about that time because we did. Um, Laser Love and Life in the City, I think. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it would have been late '79. Yeah. It would have been after trying to get on top of the pops with one. All oh, right, so is that after that? Yeah, fell top of the pops bit. Okay, yeah. And um, at that time, you you'd obviously still hadn't quite settled on the the perfect after the fire lineup, if you like, because I know you'd had Nick Battle for Signs of Change, and then. Ivor Twiddle played on on Laser Love, and then he he left, and um, you had Nick Brotherwood for a bit, and then finally you got Pete King in. So then then you were sort of settled for a few years, I suppose. Really, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what what I was going to mention, uh, I saw you at the Rainbow in 1979, the first time you played there, and then you played two years running up, three years running in 80 and 81. How did that gig come about in the first place? Because it was quite a uh, big, big place to play, wasn't it? Really, it, it was a risk. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was a risk. I mean, what, what, 1979 in the UK was very good for After the Fire because not only had we had the one rule scraping the the bottom of the top forty, but we'd had other songs that had done well um, on radio play. And so there was an awareness of, uh, about the band. And then in the autumn, we in, embarked on this 40 day tour of the UK, Scotland and, and uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, well, North and Southern Ireland. So and, and the, the rainbow was the kind of closing day to that tour. Uh, and, and it just uh, the whole thing worked. Um, there was a buzz about the band. So lots of people came to see us at all the venues we had some absolutely incredible nights uh, in in some some cities uh i either got ill um in the scotland the the edinburgh gig and the day that was the day before we were leaving for northern ireland and we'd already re knew either was leaving we'd rehearsed um with um Nick, Nick. Nick. Yeah. Uh, and so we literally phoned him up and said, is there any chance you can fly <laughs> <laughs> to Ireland? Um, and so the first day in Colerain was not our, the highlight of the 40 day yeah. tour, shall we say, but the next night he did really well in, in Belfast, in Queen's yeah. Hall. And I mean, those gigs were just stupendous. The, the Queen's Hall Belfast gig was absolutely amazing. And remember that was right in the middle of the troubles. Yeah, because so, I was going to say, um, presumably very few bands actually made it over to Northern Ireland, but, but you were one of the few who did and um, any bands that came got, got a good um, response, didn't they? Yeah. And it, and it and it was a magical night. Yeah. Because again, it, it, the two things it seemed to be that that was the sport and the arts would be able to um, remove the the division between um, the, the tribes, as it were. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it and it was just so heartwarming to think that you were contributing to some moments of joy um, mm. when the when the angst. Um, was not present yeah 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 and then i think the rain was the first rainbow gig recorded um it was yeah and one or two tracks came on other albums but there was never a live album for after the fire was that the reason for that uh the, the, i think the thought was to um to release it as a live album that that was the the mission in fact it was yeah. to, to show um 
uh, that um, we had nothing against Rupert Hine ourselves. We we asked Rupert Hine to to be in the mobile unit, which was I'm pretty sure it's the Rolling Stones mobile recording yeah. studio out the back, um, and so yeah, it, it just nothing nothing ever came of it um and i think that was partly because we ran into a, a, a immediately after the rainbow i think the rainbow was the last date of the year mm. that year that mm. we had uh and and we went we pretty much went into the recording studio to start recording uh, the album that would be known as atf mm. uh, and that was with Nick uh, and that that was the next project was to record the album mm. the next album the follow-up to laser love yeah yeah uh, and and then that uh, we then had a very bad spot so I think the um, the live album or the after the fire live or ATF live whatever it was going to be didn't come out or, or was not pursued because we embarked on the ATF album. Uh, sadly, uh, things didn't work out with Nick as a as a drummer. And um, we, whilst we'd recorded the album, the album was turned down by CBS, and effectively the band was kind of put to one side and told you got to do better yeah yeah <laughs> the sure. progress report was <laughs> not not good that year uh, well yeah. it wasn't that year it was it was the um time is always compressed because mm. now three months doesn't sound like a very long time but back <laughs> then it was an yeah, eternity yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um yeah. yeah so we had to we had to recruit a new drummer which meant auditioning mm. um out of our I we auditioned an ever such a lot of drummers <laughs> I'm sure it was more than 100 drummers really um, yeah but, but the, by then it was easy to get people to audition because yeah. we had we were in a name band albeit um lower yeah. league yeah um yeah. and yeah I mean Pete just shone and that was a fantastic result to get such a fantastic yeah. superbly skilled mm. yeah uh, and and such a an amazing guy mm. He, mm. Fitted, he fitted in brilliantly yeah because uh, i've got a copy of that um album that was rejected and there's quite a few songs on there that i think were, were worthy of being on i'm like operator and satellite in orbit um just a couple there but they got shelved and and the new you know put a few other different ones on and then the album came out yeah and they, yeah. they accepted it so that it was okay in the end yeah there was a change of producer uh, yeah. as well um, yeah. we were working with tony mansfield who who we loved uh and we had some great times um, yeah. doing that album but we were just conscious all the way through that, that something something wasn't right mm um and by the way cbs rejecting that album as it was and and i know that there are many people that um are, are from the people that like after the fire and were following us at the time that really liked the album um if they got hold yeah, of a copy got like, to like you do show that. yeah there we go yeah um yeah but um the the version one of the album it it was the right decision um for it not to come out that in terms of a piece of art mm. commercially i am less sure yeah i think yeah. It, what it did it 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 disrupted the momentum mm. that we had at the time mm. um and then when the later version we worked with mac and and mac we had a fantastic relationship with the producer mac mm. um who came over and normally he only works in his own studio because he, he'd worked with quite a few other big names hadn't he i think it was oh yeah. Queen. yeah yeah queen elo um yeah. Giorgio moroda loads of loads of people yeah um and um he came over and 
we um, produced some demos and I think they chose maybe three songs to replace the two that you mentioned and I think it was Another World was the other one. Yeah, that that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, got the CBS elbow. Um, and uh, yeah, so and then that album that album came out and and that was the one that um pretty much launched us in in europe yeah uh, yeah um other than england it was it just took off in in germany um and there it went out to austria um and and sweden and other places so yeah because um was it bayern munich football club used um was it um the actual 1980f instrumental track for the coming out uh, when they put come out onto the pitch is that right that's absolutely right yeah, yeah. and yeah. that happened a little bit later um mm. what happened was there was a, a a kids program um on telly called nasawas or mm. something like that or nasa was um <laughs> and uh it was used as the theme music all, albeit a different um recording but the, the piece of music got very well known quite early on mm. and so when um that that became it just became very popular yeah yeah and um you you had a few singles from the album love will make you will always make you cry and wild west show they didn't quite make it in the into the charts in this country uh, who who decided what singles should come off the album? Was it the band or the producer or CBS or, or what? Uh, I normally it was the record company, mm. uh, but but we always put our two bits in our suggestions in. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah that generally we had we did have views on what what would be a good single mm. um and sometimes that matched and <laughs> <laughs> other times not not so yeah um love will always make you cry we we were a little bit surprised that but what what happened with that there was a chap called rex smith in the us that covered it and he he was quite well known but not over here. Mm. Um, and I think that they thought that there might be some um, cross Atlantic uh, fertilization of the mm. of yeah, yeah. Of knowledge of the song. Mm. Um, but no, that didn't really happen. Wild West show didn't happen. And, and I think part of that was we made a monumental blunder as a as a band and had a had a great day out on horses and shooting guns. <laughs> yeah, do doing the video. video which, yeah, yeah. Which was a really bad idea. It was just too obvious, too cliched, mm. um, and very inappropriate for what we, our kind of ethos as a band, mm. um, as kind of concerned humans, mm. uh, totally against that sort of killing and. So, uh, but the problem was we, we didn't learning the, how to, uh, contribute towards a video story, storyboard was another skill that we hadn't mm. yeah, learned. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and really, um, Wild West show was one of the first storyboarded videos we were involved in. Mm. If not the first, uh, we did one for one rule for you, but that was just standing there playing it, mm. which um, is is not that creative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, one other thing that happened in 1981, you did a, a gig with you too at the, the BBC, I understand as well, and they they weren't that big then, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, and no, I mean that was that was interesting. We'd met um you two a few times uh and um because of the, the similarity in in a position of um of faith mm. we kind of um 
vowed never to be on the same stage uh, at the, uh, the same time. We just thought that, uh, you know, we just spread ourselves about a bit. Mm. Uh, and what had happened was that it was the BBC in concert um, performance, which we'd already we'd already done a couple of, I think, um, 79 and 80. And it was a good kind of half hour set uh, live on uh, I, well it probably probably live or broadcast a little bit later but on radio one which oh. um was prime channel then and um so the bbc had had a cancellation and they asked us to step in because we happened to be in the country and um we were all geared up we were it, it was not a day that we were actually playing um oh. or recording and we rocked up and found out the other band was you too so <laughs> <laughs> oh well well <laughs> kismet we'll go with it yeah yeah sure yeah and then in um 1981 you uh final album that batteries not included um that came out and um a lot of fans think that's your most sort of polished album and yeah, yeah. It, it did get a lot of um exposure like um i think you're on swap shop on bbc tv and mike reed made rich boys uh his single record of the week um you know and I, I always thought that was a, a great single but it, it just never got into the charts did it unfortunately no i mean I, a lot of them just got scraped into the top 75 but never yeah got yeah up sure. to the top 40 i mean there's, mm. there's a list of singles that that we had that that mm did quite well um yeah. i think pretty much everything that we ever released mm. sold okay but yeah. not fantastically mm. the irony is now of course if it was released the, the the figures compared to what you can do to get in the charts now is, yeah. is um, we'd be way up there yeah um, yeah. yeah yeah it was a it was um it was a, a great technically it's a great album Mm. That in it, it is the best work that we've uh, on recorded work, and mm. we and it also enabled us um, to be a little bit more experimental. Mm. We had some tracks that that um, I started on the home studio. We took the tape out and transferred it to the sixteen track, uh, the twenty four track rather, and built them up in the studio. We we had tracks that we constructed um we reconstructed mm. in in the studio having had all this series of ideas and demos um and the album sounds great it, it's um it's still pretty a lot of it is very current in terms of its drum sound and mm. um it, it, it's um texture yeah yeah but uh yeah um and, and it, one of the reasons I don't think it had the longevity of maybe the other couple of albums was because somebody somewhere, I think it was in Sweden, decided to make a compilation album. Mm. Uh, and so batteries got effectively deleted quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. In preference to a compilation, compilation album mm. uh, drawn from all three albums. Mm. And then in it's 1982, you ended up touring with Queen and ELO in Europe, I think, for the first part of the year. Yes, it was ELO first. Yeah. Um, that was the first big tour, uh, uh, opening act tour that we did. Um, because in we'd both in Europe and the UK, mm. we the, the, the size of gig that we were playing in the UK, say the universities and so on, 400 to 700, mm. um, we were headlining. Uh, and so the same type of venues in Holland and Germany, we were able to headline. But to make the jump up to the kind of 15,000, uh, between 10 and 25,000, Mm. we weren't able to do that. So the idea was that we would do an opening act uh, as, a, as a stepping stone to achieve yeah. that. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, and we went out with ELO and, um, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so did it help with record sales? Would you say at, at that time? Um, it cemented the, 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 the knowledge. So the, so the people that were going to gigs, mm. it cemented the knowledge of the songs that people already knew from the radio. Yeah, yeah. So there was this recognition, I mean, particularly uh, 1980F, when we played that, the place used to go absolutely mm. um, wild. And, and that was really gratifying. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so that, that helped the knowledge of the band. And yes, it did help. It, it certainly did help mm. record sales. Yeah. And, um, we were selling an awful lot more in the different countries um, yeah, yeah. in Europe than we were mm. uh, in the UK after a while. Yeah. And particularly from um, the ATF album, the ATF album was, was the equivalent of laser love in yeah. the UK. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was the, it was the album that people bought um, because that's when they got to know the band. It was yeah. that album that was out mm. 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 in in particularly in in Germany and Austria. Yeah, um, it, it, it was gas. It was Germany, Austria, Switzerland. They were <laughs> the three countries yeah. that mm. um, uh, could influence your your figures. Yeah, sure. And then later in 1982, you went over to the USA to support Van Halen. Was that the first time you've been to America as, as a band or? Yes, it was. Yeah. 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 And I mean, in the meantime, we'd also toured with Queen, which was uh, yeah, yeah, pretty epic. Um, so going back to a lot of the same venues that we had with ELO, yeah, sure. Um, and we noticed that the audience was much more keen to come and see us um, mm. than they had been perhaps with ELO. And then, yeah, yeah. So we going on to later, um, sort of about July time, I think we left the UK, uh, and we were gone a long time. I mean, it mm. was three months odd. Yeah. Um, we didn't come back till October, I think. Um, and, uh, it, we hadn't, no, we had not been to the, the U S as a band. Yeah. And so, was that a bit of an eye opener for you? Um, you know, just, just the actual country itself and so on. Uh, it was, there was so much about it that was huge. Mm. Um, the tour, the, the size of the venues generally was, was vast, absolutely yeah. mm. enormous. Mm. Um, we also did some of our own dates while we we're out there. Right. Um, and so they were a lot, that was like going back to square yeah. one. Yeah, early, early days. Small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had to, in, we had to change what we were doing we had to improve our act mm. because whatever anybody thought about van halen on stage they were incredibly impressive mm. um i mean it was a it was a barrage of um sound mm. um but the virtuosity of eddie the uh flamboyance of alex on on drums the competence of Anthony on bass and then the absolute outrageous behavior uh, and presence mm. of Dave Lee Roth. Um, mm. I mean, they were absolutely at their height. I, it was like going on the biggest tour of the year. We just happened to land on our mm. feet yeah. on that one. Mm. Um, and yeah, so uh, <laughs> as far as getting to know the US, I think, um, I remember we all felt this is nothing like the US that we see in the cinema yeah, yeah. Uh, or on telly. Mm. It's very different. Um, mm. It was only really when you got close to Hollywood that mm. it started to look the same. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, very different. What, what about the fact that Van Halen were known as a sort of, I suppose, heavy metal band and you were completely different musically how did that go down with the audiences and things like that were, were you accepted some or rejected at other places uh well it, it was hugely varied because it's such a big yeah uh, territory that um mm. 
you you have people that uh, the the almost the taste of people is regional yeah. so in some places that but um you would expect mm. us to go down really well yeah we didn't mm. and places that the crew particularly um thought that we would be in real jeopardy um were some of our highlights yeah yeah so for instance we struggled in in san francisco mm. which you'd have thought a, a hipper place mm. they might be more open yeah um, and, and more acceptive of, of something yeah. so we struggled there um we struggled in another place, Phoenix, Arizona, but that is that was a tradition that uh, that at every um, opening act is terrorised by the audience to, to see how quick they can get them off stage. And we yeah. lasted longer than most after mm. four songs. We were. We did, were what did they actually throw stage. things at you or just boo you? Oh or gosh, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was a. a um yeah just a, a complete barrage of of, of abuse and mm. um ghastly things i mean there were some horrendous things they threw at us full bottles um i got cut uh on the eye here mm. just just near the eye by a coin cool. um, mm. um we had some really uh, bullets loads of loads of stuff i mean it was just <laughs> unbelievable um and then other other places mm um we we would go down an absolute storm yeah oh yeah and it's a pity you didn't have the single de commissar out then when you were touring in america because it, it you know well it, i mean it was a hit obviously but um that might have helped a bit yeah i mean that's it's it's a bit of a it could have been a bit of a paradox because that that is almost further away from mm. van halen Oh yeah, <laughs> the after the, the the rest of the mm. ATF material. So yeah. whether that would have prohibited us from actually securing mm. the place on that tour, yeah, yeah, could have been a mm. um, a, a question mark. So uh, diff difficult to tell. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, any I I we would have probably been put with a different show yeah yeah and it would have been like going out to europe mm. so mm. we'd have been much it would have been more uh not quite so challenging yeah shall we, yeah. Say. Mm. Mm. we had to work really hard mm. our socks off to get any um response in on the, on the van Halen tour and yeah. we thought we were a pretty good live band i mean we've done these two big tours with elo and queen mm. uh, and we thought we were pretty good but and we thought mm. queen and elo mm. were pretty good but yeah mm. in terms of the performance and mm. the stagecraft that um uh van halen put into their show it was yeah. it was no holds barred mm. Mm. no holding back it was phenomenal mm. um, but having said that of course it was a real privilege to see queen um in the in their heyday as well mm, mm. Uh, I, I mentioned how big the tour of uh, van halen was we when we were in the us uh there was a, a a point at which we we got close to where queen were touring mm. in the us and so they came to see us and it, which was uh intriguing because they were all in our dressing room <laughs> um and then we went to see them mm. at a show and it was a lot a lot more modest than the van halen mm. Um, mm. show at that time mm. so to give to, to give some sense of, sense of scale and van halen were just huge mm. at, at mm. that moment mm. uh, i mean i've got to mention the single jump that van halen did and it was mm -hmm. probably their biggest ever hit and it it was so after the fire you know have you got any comment on that at all a lot of people ask me about that and yeah and, and, and i think that there is an assumption made that um that eddie kind of uh ripped off the style of 1980f mm. and, and and songs like that but he was already he was a classically trained 
pianist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he already could play. And now, and if, if people really wanted to go into detail, I mean, I'm actually thinking about doing a specific video on the, on, uh, on this topic on right. my yeah. video channel about playing style, because I, I, I think it's more about inspiration rather than influence. Yeah. yeah so sure. I absolutely can say that, um, Eddie, my Eddie was inspired Mm. by what I was doing uh, yeah. and, and after the mm. fire. But yeah. whether it was an influence, I, I really don't think it was. No, because no. Because he, he, he was, he, he had huge musicality. Yeah. A lot of the stuff, the tapping mm. stuff that he was playing on the guitar is incredibly classically influenced. Mm. Mm. Um, but there's a, there's a deeper level mm. as well, which is really tedious and boring, but it's the way he would play that piece mm. if yeah. I, I, mean, I uh, when i heard it i immediately sat down and sort of played what i thought was the piece and mm. people would listen to it no that's different and that's because my the way i play the certain timing things i bring in mm. to my playing is marginally different and yeah. to me that's sufficient to identify mm. that his piece is different and, yeah. and it is not a direct influence yeah, sure. uh, from after the fire. Mm. And it is certainly not, not a real. Mm. So I, I am quite magnanimous about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, it gives me, it gives me a little bit of joy to think that perhaps the conversations I had with him around my keyboard when I was talking about it, yeah. on, mm. that it, it, it uh, encouraged him to mm. go for a little bit more synth on the, uh, yeah, because obviously it wasn't it wasn't heavy metal, was it really? <laughs> no, no, and that's a great album as well. It's yeah, yeah, great. sure. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, there's a there's a couple of other um, songs that I mean, I don't know if people have sort of pointed them out to you or you know. I mean, Pete Townsend did a song called "Let Let My Love Open the Door," and that was very sounded very much like After the Fire keyboards. And then Kim Wilde had a hit with a, a song called "Water on Glass," and again, it sounded very sort of after the fiery, I don't know if you're aware of those two songs at all. Uh, well, yes, because um, on the Pete Townsend one, well, they they both feature the Yamaha CS80, the keyboard. Right, so which, yeah, same same keyboard, yeah. Uh, and 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 it's such a uh, such a huge sound that mm. keyboard. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and it's got a real signature that you can pick up. Mm. Um, so I think that's part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think it. I think there's a sort of swirl of um, uh, things going around. I mean, for instance, some people have said that "Who's Gonna Love You," our song, sounds a bit, little bit like the Police, um, mm. because of the two, <laughs> the slow semi reggae section. Yeah, and yeah. Then other songs sound like that, and then then I remember reading a review of Billy Joel, and somebody in the in the article. So he's saying, oh, he's, he's obviously been listening to After the Fire. <laughs> so, you know, hang on a minute. He was huge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. Mm. I, I think it's, mm. I think that it, it's very gratifying to think yeah. that perhaps mm. we were listened to. Yeah, um, yeah. So after that sort of uh, tremendous year of, of all these big dates and touring and everything, you decide to give it, get, call it a day in, at the end of 1982. Is that, is that right? Yeah, um, that had been brewing. Um, yeah. And during the the US tour, it had been brewing and there'd been discussions taking place. Um, we were in such a hole financially. Mm. And the idea behind Dare Commissar is that it was going to come out on a different label mm. um, uh, on Atlantic. And the deal was all done. But then CBS released it in Canada and Atlantic said, no, the deal we had was for North America um, and they pulled the deal. Now, that would have completely wiped out our debt mm. at the time. They, um, we would have we would have gone into a, a financially viable situation. Mm. We were 
and we were nearly a hundred thousand pounds in debt to Harvey Goldsmith. Now this is back in eighty two. You mm. got to remember that is an mm. awful lot more money now. The record company looked like we were never ever going to pay it off. Um, so we had these two huge. Okay, the record company was a recoupable debt, but the Harvey uh, the management debt was was because he he was managing you now, was he then? Yes, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, that was a real debt that was. Mm had to be paid back mm. so yeah we were in a hole uh, and we saw no way out of it of course we didn't know that Derek Commissar was going to go on and be a monster hit um, mm. we had no idea that that was going to happen that mm, could well have changed everything yeah yeah um, did that pay off the debt then the, the fact that it, it sold so, so many copies around the world or? Uh, and it paid off the debt last year. All right. <laughs> yeah. That was so the first record royalties that After the Fire ever received. Was last really? Year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so it's obviously still getting played around the world some somewhere. Then, if you're getting some royalties through, I presume. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it 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 has phenomenal yeah. figures. Yeah. Um, but because it's now on streams and yeah. not even downloads anymore, it's not that much money. But we, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're talking, you're you're talking millions of plays. A year yeah, yeah. Mm. Still. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So after you left after the fire, and Andy Piercy re resurrected it in a way, um, but it, I think it was called ATF or whatever, and that never happened that he decided to record an album but it never actually happened is, is that right yeah he recorded an album but it um uh it, it, I, after a while he was dropped um, yeah, by yeah. The record label so that just fell apart yeah so by then you were in zip codes with pete king um yes. how how did that go did, it, it was just a two two years or so was it um, it was about four four years, I think. Mm. Um, no, maybe, yeah, no, about four years. Uh, yeah. So what what happened was we were picked up by Brian Lane, um, uh, Yes's manager. Yes, yes, manager. Yeah. Uh, and um, he got us a deal with publishing, mm. um, so w which meant that we were able to. Um, to have a, a a little bit of money each month, which made things a lot easier, and we were able to kind of finance some rehearsal time, and so we got together a group of musicians. Um, we did record an album eventually. Mm. Again, some of those were hybrid tracks. They were a mix of stuff that we'd done at home, stuff that we'd done at home taken into the studio. We worked with Hans Zimmer. Mm. who's very famous now as as a film music um composer yeah uh, and very successful as well and, mm. and very skillful uh so it was a privilege to get to know him uh and we we had some great musicians um people like steve howe played on it um from yes um and uh so yeah then I, we did quite a few dates but it the lineup kept changing mm. um it was it's always hard to hold together a band it, it seemed that it was living in the shadow of after the fire but trying to be different mm. Mm. i think we were more aiming to be more um commercially more more pop if you like yeah after yeah after the fires rock um but yeah so it didn't really it didn't it didn't take off um mm. we tried <laughs> yeah so what's happened to the album then did that have never ever been released or no it did it came out what we did is we um we got permission from all the different producers and, and different uh, places and released it on a limited edition cassette. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, they, yeah, they all 
sold and we're toying with the idea of having it as a uh, sort of iTunes download on yeah, Spotify yeah. or something. Mm. I, I, I don't know. I, d I don't think there's sufficient interest in it to warrant the mm. warrant the work. Yeah, yeah. So the presumably the cassette is a collector's item nowadays then. Oh, bound to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So right. So after after that, you you just went out of the min music industry completely and you set up your own sort of computer business and so on no, or, or no, do you do I something did. else yeah no i did i i was involved in building a studio um out in the sticks in village not far from here called tolsbury yeah and uh had a really nice professional recording studio and did music to picture there mm. uh, and what happened the, the slip into the computing side was really uh, because we were using computers in the studio, we would get mm. these people that would come in and use the studio and say, that's brilliant. I really would like you to, can you get me a system? Can you mm. tell me what's in that system? And I thought, well, there's a bit of a market here. So mm. literally we just started to sell a replica of what we had in the studio yeah. to other musicians. Um, mm. and so we just did deals with the suppliers. Yeah. And that kind of just grew so I could see it could become a business. So um, I, n I never stopped the work in the in the on the on the music side. Mm. But the other thing that happened um, concurrently were, was this move away from the more analog tape based large mixer systems to a more digital recording. Yeah, yeah. And we were already using samplers and so on to, uh, to trigger uh, short recordings, digital recordings. So that was, uh, so I was conscious that perhaps the big studio that I'd got might not be the right way ahead. Mm. Uh, and so I sold the analog equipment and just concentrated on digital recording. And I pretty much went from different systems. Uh, and so the system I've got now is still, uh, is still, let's have a think. It was only a couple of years later, a few years later that, um, the, the software Pro Tools, what I had way back is still version something yeah, yeah. further mm. down the line. Mm. So I never really stopped doing it. I just didn't do it as much as a full time job. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. It was when I was commissioned to write a piece of music or prepare a piece of music or do some sound work, I would yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah. And so being being the boss of mm. a computer company or a company that I mean, we went pretty quickly from computer to internet. So it was very media based, mm. uh, web based, um, just just to be able to make myself free uh, when mm. um, when needed to do if I had some musical projects on the go. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, in 1999, there was a reunion of sorts um for your birthday in Dagenham I think um yeah uh, with Andy Percy and then that was just like a one-off and then in in 2004 you actually we had the act of the fire fans convention and you played with John Russell and um his son and and someone else and then you started going out on the road again doing a few dates for a few years yeah we did yeah Yes, yeah, so let's have a think. Yeah, from what yeah, I understand, maybe, maybe maybe three or four years. Yeah, um, yeah, we did some dates. Um, we tried to keep them together as a as a tour. Yeah. Um, mm. So that the various um, van rentals and so on, they were just in in one go. Yeah. Yeah. And did you enjoy that or, you know, because obviously it's a, like, I suppose, a, a bit of nostalgia for the fans and everything, but, you know, presumably you, 
you were quite happy playing again and, and so on. Yeah, I, I enjoy it's an in, it's an interesting word that you've chosen there. Mm. Um, it was it part of it was fine mm. because there was no pressure to prove yourself or mm. that this was vital for your yeah, career yeah. or anything mm. like that. That that this mm. this was supposed to be for fun. However. Um, it, it seemed to take an awful lot of organising, which I, in the after the fire days, I've got used to there being yes. a team of people behind the scenes. Yes, yes, someone else is doing it for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that wasn't very comfortable. So it was a mixture, um, mm. and after a while, I think it. I think it it was less enjoyable than it than it should have been. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do you think you'll ever do it again, or is that that's that's it now? I think that's it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th I think it's it's it was of its time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think we appreciated how well we'd done mm. at the time. Mm. Yeah, and certainly looking at the the figures now, we actually get some figures to see. Mm. Um, uh, the, the sales and so on um, in terms of, of units mm. and the success on Spotify um, mm. it, it, it's that's very gratifying mm. um, and the number of people that still would like to talk to me yeah. <laughs> like your good self yeah um, that's uh, yeah that's we're, we're quite a long time Mm. after after the fire now <laughs> yeah uh, and so that's yeah th that's honoring mm. yeah because obviously after the fire i've always been one of my favorite bands and it it's been great to talk to you so just finishing off um i understand you you're involved in in local politics now a little bit of your time and with the green party is, is that right i am indeed yes yeah and you you stood in the local elections recently, but um, didn't quite get there. From what oh, well, we did very well. Um, yeah. mm. uh, I mean, to, in, in for the Green Party, um, mm. there were two elections that um, that came up this time. One was the um, Essex County Council, and the other yeah. was the local um, uh, Colchester Borough Council. And to beat the other main parties mm. th these are very strong conservative held seats um to to beat both labor and the lib dems uh, and any independence um that was a big that's that's um that's a little feather in my a little green feather in my cap <laughs> yeah yeah sure yeah 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 okay well we'll wind it up there but i mean it's been fascinating finding out you know from your your point of view what what after the fire was like and and all the different things going on behind the scenes and i'm sure people listening in will have enjoyed it as well so thank you very much peter uh, well well thank you very much mark and thank you for s still us uh, still being one of your favorite bands that's, yeah that, that's <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's plenty of other people you. yeah okay and, but... uh, i wish you all the best all right thanks <laughs>